Has there ever been a more horrifying death than drowning on dry land as your lungs fill with their own fluids? During the trench fighting of the First World War, the armies found both old and new ways to inflict horrifying cruelties on each other. From barbed wire to mustard gas to beating each other to death with trenching tools, the cruelties of combat were relentless, and even life between the fighting was filled with suffering. This was the war that should have ended all wars. So let's explore the horrors of trench warfare, from the daily misery of cold and damp through to some of the most appalling weapons in the whole of human history. At the start of the First World War, no one expected the fighting they actually saw. Prepared for a war of shock attacks and swift movement, both sides were left bewildered when the fighting bogged down in the damp ground of Belgium and northeastern France. Soldiers hastily started digging trenches, trying to create shelter both from the weather and from the war, using whatever tools and materials came to hand. This set soldiers up for misery from the start. The trenches couldn't properly protect them from the weather, and they suffered from bitter cold as winter crept in. Lower than the surrounding ground, the trenches naturally filled with water when rain came, especially in the low ground toward the northern end of the lines. The combination of poor hygiene, cold, and inescapable damp did terrible things to men's flesh. Many suffered from trench foot, in which their feet swelled and decayed. Toes fell off, infection spread from corrupted flesh. A large number of people crammed into unsanitary conditions was ideal territory for infections. Tapeworm and other intestinal parasites ran rampant. Trench fever caused rashes, headaches, and lethargy. Gangrenous wounds killed men injured in the fighting. Only the work of military doctors like Sir William Boog Leishman saved the men from worse, with Leishman's inoculation campaign saving hundreds of thousands from the typhoid fever that had plagued previous campaigns. Meanwhile, there was the shelling. Both sides hurled millions of shells across the lines at each other. Even men who weren't directly hit could be horrifyingly injured by shrapnel. This was another feature of the war that the sides hadn't properly prepared for, and head wounds were a huge hazard in the first year. It wasn't until summer of 1915 that the French became the first to equip their troops with steel helmets, creating the iconic image of First World War soldiers with only their heads armored. Other armies quickly followed, but even with this protection, artillery caused around three-quarters of the war's casualties ripping bodies open, shredding faces, and leaving men to bleed out in the mud. The horrors were made worse in some places by the static nature of the war and the lack of opportunities to clear away what had come before. In places on the Gallipoli Peninsula, the ground of the trenches became spongy as the bodies left by previous fighting rotted beneath soldiers' feet. They were living from day to day on the bodies of their comrades with all the stink, the sickness, and the trauma that brought. Then came the fighting. At the start of the war, generals expected the fighting to move quickly because of the devastating firepower of new weapons such as machine guns. But those weapons were the reason the fighting bogged down. Two men with a machine gun could mow down in advance in minutes, wiping out forces that outnumbered them a hundred to one. It was almost impossible for an army to advance into that firepower. Still, that was what the generals demanded. Following orders given by the officers in charge, who they trusted and had sworn to obey, tens of thousands of men at a time advanced to their doom. Some were innocents who believed the propaganda claims that they would win. Others were veterans who'd seen the state of the war and could see their own deaths coming. Some marched with their heads held high, making easy targets, while others ran forward at a crouch. Whoever they were, when the bullets hit, they were torn apart. Machine gun bullets ripped through flesh and shattered bones, leaving men sprawling and screaming in the dirt. And because some units were made up of men who joined up together, entire communities could be decimated in a few minutes of flying lead. Closer to the enemy lines, the soldiers sometimes met another ghastly modern weapon, flamethrowers. Burning fuel ignited men's uniforms and their bodies, burning them alive. Skin charred and blood boiled as men choked on the smoke of their own burning flesh. All of this was made worse by an invention created to help farmers manage their cattle, barbed wire. More than a million miles of barbed wire were stretched across the defenses over the course of the war. In theory, artillery bombardments were meant to cut holes in it, but this seldom worked. Instead, advancing troops often got caught on the wire. It not only tore men's flesh, but trapped them where they were, leaving them exposed to enemy fire. Those who had been wounded were sometimes unable to find the help they needed, but left to die of injuries and exposure between the lines. 
Those who survived to reach the enemy lines faced a different sort of brutality. Among the enemy trenches, the fighting was up close and personal. Each side could hear the other's screams, whether of fury or of pain. What they often couldn't do was look each other in the eyes. The defenses were dug in zigzags called traverses to stop shrapnel from a single explosion taking out a whole trench. It was common for enemies only a few meters away to be out of sight. To get around this, soldiers lobbed grenades from one trench to another. If it worked, then the blast and shrapnel would leave the enemy dead, injured, or stunned, and the advancing troops could charge around to take out the survivors before they could recover from the shock. But it was possible to misjudge the timing on an attack like this and run into the explosion of your own grenade. When the soldiers got in sight of each other, there was sometimes gunfire, but rifles were of limited use in the close confines of a trench. The Tommy gun, beloved of American gangsters, was created to get around this, a weapon that could launch an intense short-range blast, relying on weight of fire instead of accuracy. The war's most vicious fighting was hand-to-hand. -hand. In the early days, troops weren't well equipped for this, as they hadn't expected such close combat. They had bayonets, but often reverted to using improvised weapons such as wooden clubs and trenching tools. As the war progressed, knives and pistols became more popular, and thousands of spades were sharpened to blade edges like improvised battle axes. This was an old-fashioned sort of horror, warriors looking each other in the eye as they stabbed, hacked, gouged, even strangled each other in the mud. They learned terrible things about what a weapon could do to a body. According to Eric Maria remarks all quiet on the Western Front, Many turned to sharpen trenching tools instead of bayonets because they were less likely to get stuck in human flesh. Up close and personal, it was kill or be killed, and this forced men to do terrible things. This was old-fashioned, personal killing, with the blood pumping and men close enough to hear their opponent's last breaths. But there was also a more impersonal sort of death made possible by advances in science and engineering. New weapons caused increased destruction in the trenches. Tanks crushed men beneath their tracks. Massive explosives, such as those used by the Allies at Messine Ridge, buried tens of thousands of soldiers alive, leaving them to suffocate beneath the weight of the earth. But the most monstrous weapon, the one that governments agreed to ban after the war, was poison gas. First used in early 1915, poison gas could be released from canisters or fired in artillery shells. The two most common types were chlorine and mustard gas. Chlorine got into people's lungs and throats, wrecking them. Victims drowned in the fluid from their own injured bodies as it filled their lungs. Mustard gas was equally vile, blistering and burning flesh, causing internal bleeding, vomiting and a dreadful death. Only 1.1% of deaths on the Western Front came from gas, but the damage it caused was so horrifying that it stirred dread in anyone who heard about it. The trenches of World War I were a horrifying experience. Those who survived cold and infections were forced by their commanders to march into a hail of bullets, flame, and shrapnel, then brutalize each other with bayonets and trenching tools. Some faced worse fates, crushed beneath the earth or drowning in their own fluids as gas ravaged their lungs. Is it any wonder that people thought it would be the war to end all wars?